My name is Camille Weber. We are here with Joe Alexa, the owner and wine grower of Ankeny Vineyards. It is August 17th, 2015. Our first question for you, Joe, is why wine? You know, I tell people uh, that the idea came to me after three weeks of a high fever, but that's not true. Early on in my education, I read an old Chinese adage that said the three keys to happiness. If you want to be happy for a week, kill the pig and have a feast. You want to be happy for a month, get married. You want to be happy forever, plant a garden. This is my garden. So that's kind of what started it all. Mm -hmm. a, a love affair with dirt, as some people call it. Right. So. And wine seemed to be coming on strong in the 70s is when I got interested in it. So, mm -hmm. And I was pretty sick of what I was doing. In, uh, in my college days and uh, wanted something better than sitting in an office, so this was it. Well, what was your prior career to winemaking? Um, basically, I worked for the state for 20 years in various capacities, but uh, anywhere from teaching at Oregon to Attorney General's office to the uh, Oregon Supreme Court, the executive branch, and then back to the uh, circuit court in Multnomah County. On your website, it mentions that you have four different college degrees. Do you mind sharing? The education with us? junkie. Mm -hmm. So, I'm a BA and MA in economics from San Francisco State, and then I came to Oregon in 1967, in Eugene, to uh, do a PhD in political science. And I got burned out on that after I got finished and uh, went to law school at U of O, and that's when I went to work for the state afterwards. So it's been uh, 20 years with the state of Oregon. It was my career, and I retired in 2000. So I've been retired almost as long as I was working. <laughs> well, in a nutshell. So what was it like coming to Ankeny and starting this whole project from scratch? Um, do you mind sharing with us some um, stories? I enjoyed perhaps? it. I have never regretted coming here. I was looking for grape land. Uh, back in the uh, late 70s and I looked at a variety of places and came here and just fell in love with it and uh, never regretted it. So I never looked anymore either. So it's an old farm homestead that goes back to the 1840s and uh, the pioneers are still here. They're buried in the Pioneer Cemetery at the top of the vineyard. Uh, the amazing thing about that couple is they came here from Indiana with 13 wagon loads of uh, goods, Tom and Martha Cox were the first merchants in Salem, but this is what they picked. And I figured they knew good land back then, and they were both 55 years old when they came here, so they had plenty of experience, and this is what they picked out. He was a um, orchardist and planted pears and peaches, and uh, when I came here it was pretty much uh, run down and uh, covered with blackberries. In fact, there's some pictures in the tasting room, uh, some aerial photographs from 1980 when I came here, what it looked like then, overgrown. And I knew it was 1980 because there's a red splotch by the door of my uh, kitchen, which was my red Volkswagen back then. So I was still commuting from uh, Eugene when I moved up here. So anyway, that's... Uh, and then during the 82 session, I was working at the legislature as a committee administrator for the Trade and Economic Development Committee, and that's where the uh, wine enabling legislation went through in the 82 session. And I was the committee administrator who developed the presentation to the legislators on getting the bill passed and worked with Jim Bernot and several other people back then. Fantastic. Can you talk a little bit more about that? or? Well, the most interesting thing, as far as I remember it from, is that after the session was finished, uh, there was a, uh, a garden party, Senator Groner's garden party for legislative staff and uh, lobbyists, and uh, was sitting there uh, drinking uh, beer, and Jim came over and said, what are those bushes you're growing out there? And we started talking about wine, and uh, how it was such an effort and so expensive, you really needed to get a bunch of folks together to you know, cooperate in putting a, a winery and vineyard together. And 
after the third pitcher of beer, I just, his eyes got bigger and the next thing I knew he was buying uh, that land for uh, Willamette Valley and was really successful getting off the ground. So in the meantime, I continued to work for the state and hammer away at this. So um, it was interesting early on. Mm -hmm. uh, there weren't that many people around growing and I got my first cuttings from a uh, from Don Byard, who had Hidden Springs Vineyard back then in West Salem, which is now Brooks Winery. And uh, he sold that land to Jimmy Brooks, and who also bought grapes for me back in those days. And uh, basically, I was when I started harvesting grapes in, I think, 85 was the first commercial crop. And uh, Jimmy and several other wine wineries buying wine, uh, grapes from me. And since then, I've sold to maybe a dozen different wineries, Erath, King Estate, and a, a variety of others, Patty Green, Joe Dobbs. So I still sell most of the grapes. I got into the wine business basically because back in those days, uh, if you didn't find a buyer for your grapes, you were dead in the water. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it seemed like a good idea to start making wine, which I did. And 85 was my first uh, pressing in my basement at the house and I made wine in the basement and sold it out of my dining room. That was a bad mistake. It takes over your whole life. So at that point I started working in Portland shortly thereafter I guess it was in uh, oh, I forget what year it was. It started going up there and in the late 80s I think it was and at that point I closed the winery down and maintained the vineyard and continued to sell grapes and Retired in 2000 from the state and got the bug and here it is back again So I still sell most of the grapes to other wineries and just make enough to sell directly here I don't uh, distribute anymore mm -hmm. in the retail market. So I figured it was easier to Get people to come here and eat pizza and hang out on the deck than me running around Chasing uh, retailers and fighting with distributors, etc mm -hmm. so In a nutshell so on your website, it says you are the owner and wine grower. We were wondering if you could give us your definition of what a wine grower is. Somebody who grows wine grapes, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, uh, that's a, uh, a specialty in Oregon because at the point I came here in, in the late 70s, all of the, well, at that point, there are already people here, but uh, the people that, uh, UC Davis, which is the Harvard of wine schools down there, always used to say you can't grow grapes in Oregon. They'll never get ripe, uh, they'll rot, the birds will eat them, etc. Well, some years they're right, but uh, not always. And Richard Summers and David Lett apparently uh, missed those lectures because they, they went to that school and they came here anyway and planted grapes. <laughs> and from then on, it's just been an uh, uphill battle to uh, find out what works best. And uh, it's uh, some techniques involved in growing grapes in Oregon, because Oregon is really a, considered a marginal climate. We have uh, late spring frosts and early fall rains, and that's the window to get grapes ripe. Fortunately, uh, if you're in the right location, uh, you can do that. I've never had a bad crop in, since 1985. So it's, but it takes uh, special, uh, pruning techniques, trellising techniques, a variety of things. Like we pull leaves on the east side of the plant in the, in the summer to get the sunshine in on the, in the morning and leave the leaves on the west side to keep it from sunburning, which is a fierce problem this year with so much sun. So it's a little different than growing grapes in California. Fortunately, we're blessed here that we don't have nearly the many the, the bugs or the problems that Californians have although we have our share. So I think it's just a very, a very special way of farming. It's, it's still farming, but like any farming, uh, there, there are certain techniques that are, are required to uh, produce a good crop uh, in this state particularly, because a good crop is ripe grapes, and if you don't have ripe grapes, you don't get very far. And sometimes in some places, they don't get ripe. Mm -hmm. Is there a particular harvest that you remember either being rather rewarding or difficult? 
Uh, that's kind of vague. I remember the bad ones more because <laughs> harvesting in the rain is not fun in the mud and uh, various other problems that go with that. And we've had some, some years when it started raining in September and rained for a month. And uh, what grapes got ripe, it was really tough getting them off. Good harvests are uh, fairly common around here. I almost always have a good harvest. And unless the weather it gets weird, uh, really, or it starts raining, because like 07 was a really rainy year. And uh, that was tough, because we left a lot of grapes hanging. Uh, at least 10 tons of Pinot in the water, which is a chunk of money that, uh, for the birds. So, and they don't give you a deduction uh, for donations to uh, Audubon Society or anything like that for feeding birds. So it's just <laughs> gone. But most, uh, most uh, location is everything, like any other real estate, and uh, location and uh, vineyards are, are primary. And we're still finding out, I think, uh, where the best locations are. Clearly, some of the better uh, wineries have located in, in good locations, and they get good crops. But uh, from what I can see, if you get too far to the west or too far to the east, out of this valley, uh, things get different. And if you get higher, things are different. And you can be a couple of weeks behind in harvest uh, if you have higher elevations and too far to the east or west. So there's kind of a golden part of the valley where grapes will get ripe consistently. If they don't get ripe consistently, you generally don't stay in business long. Right. So. Well, speaking of location, we did talk briefly um, a few moments ago about um, the Cox Cemetery um, and how you kind of felt the need to start Ankeny here. But I was wondering um, if there is anything in particular that you saw on this property um, that made you attracted to it um, to start your business. The house. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at a lot of places that were bare land. In some places they had started vineyards, but no place to live. And commuting from Eugene, I needed some place to live. And uh, this house really struck me. I love the house. And um, it, it's, it's built on the same foundation where the original Pioneer House was built. And it burned in 1914, and they rebuilt us. So my house is 101 years old this year. But I've done a lot of remodeling, and uh, it's a very comfortable house. And the view. I think they really lucked out when, when they picked this. This is a fabulous place. They knew enough about the weather back then to build the houses on the knolls above the valley floor because before the dams were put in on the Willamette and the other rivers feeding it, this probably flooded pretty regularly. And uh, so all the pioneer, there are three pioneer homesteads in this end of the valley and they're all built up on the knolls, mm -hmm. you know. And again, I figured they knew good land back then. If he was a, uh, an orchardist, he was looking for good land. And uh, the other thing was uh, there was this beautiful old barn, uh, Pioneer Barn, and it's in the picture also on the, uh, the original picture, the aerial. Uh, when I came here, and it, it sat right there, it was a huge barn, because he had a lot of workhorses, and I was told by a, a barn architect uh, specialized in uh, historic barns that it was 50% bigger than the typical barn of that era. And it was all hand-hewn beams, like 16 inches square. And uh, I was, had this fantasy about what a great pioneer winery building that would make. And only later did I learn that uh, whitewash covers many sins. And it was dry rotted all the way through. Oh. So there was no saving that I would pound nails in it and it'd go right through the dry rot. So it took me about 10 years to get it torn down. So, and rid of it. Fortunately, uh, that happened before someone came along and wanted to get it on a historic register. It would still be there looking at it. <laughs> so, um, that was all part of the move-in decision. But it was, it was rough. It was a really overgrown, really had been neglected. And they had a combination of a grass seed, pasture, and woodlot. It was mm -hmm. about what was left. But, this area has been farmed, pretty much everything grown in the valley has been grown here probably at one time or another over the years. And uh, it's turned out to be a really good location in a sense that I think my own opinion in terms of uh, criteria for good land 
you got to have heat, which is low to the valley floor. We got a lot of heat here. It's got a nice aspect to the sun comes up and goes down over there, so we get sunshine all day long. And also the slope of the hill gives a good air drainage, plus the good soil. You know, all of those things came together and the grapes just took off. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was not a problem. The problem was just getting it planted, which took a number of years, but I planted bits and pieces over the years. And the last block was the one up there, was planted in uh, 2005. Wow. So the earliest plants uh, were planted in 82. Took me a year or so just to get the blackberries beaten back and uh, the ground ready to go. And, and I put up with the local farmer saying, you can't grow grapes here. Well, lo and behold, here they are. But uh, yeah, it's been an interesting experience. It was a great uh, relief uh, from uh, working for the state that uh, come home on the weekends and do this. So yeah, I say I've never regretted it. Well, great. I mean, you shouldn't. <laughs> Not to mention the fact that uh, there's much more benefits in uh, growing grapes and making wine than, uh, say, growing grass seed. When times are tough, you can't drink your grass seed. So <laughs> you can the wine, though. So another way of looking at it. So speaking of wine, I was wondering if you could describe the terroir of uh, Ankeny. What you think? How you would describe it? Well, m most, uh, much of about half of it. Again, if you look at those pictures, those aerials, you'll see how the layout is, and uh, then there's sort of a moderate slope, and then it goes up. And on the lower elevations is more of a clay soil, a styrofoam clay. They have a different names for it, mm -hmm. but uh, the upper side, the hillside, is uh, Nakai, which is a little looser dirt and a better drainage. But the problem with uh, the, uh, the styrofoam and the clay soil, it's so vigorous that I have a lot of foliage growth. And so I've got to deal with uh, that vigor, which is a blessing to have compared to people who don't have vigor and they really have to nurse their plants to get anything off them. Here it's more of a, an abundance of uh, leaves, growth and, 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 and fruit. So we drop a lot of fruit and pull a lot of leaves and hack back on a lot of vines on the lower levels just to uh, get through the, the season. So earlier you mentioned um, some of the kids from UC Davis coming down. Um, and I was wondering if you had any kind of other relationships with other winemakers or vineyard owners around in the area? Oh, in the old days I did. In the old days there was a group of still meets actually here uh, in the Salem, West Salem area that uh, Don Byard organized way back when and I used to meet monthly and I met a lot of the folks from Bethel Heights and uh, from uh, um, Amity and some of the other local winemakers here and we'd get together and drink wine and talk about wine. But uh, after things really got going, working full time and uh, trying to do this too, I sort of dropped out of the contact and I haven't been to a winery. Well, I, no, I can't say that. I, just this last year we went wine touring with some friends in the east side that I've never been to. But I don't spend much time with other winemakers nowadays. So, Were you involved in any kind of wine events or organizations? State fair. Mm -hmm. Oregon uh, Willamette Valley Wine Growers Organization and uh, you know, the usual uh, industry organizations, but beyond that, no. So what were your roles in those organizations? And Spectator. In Spectator? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's not a bad role. No, no. No, I, 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 yeah, again, it was uh, working full time until, up until 2000. It wasn't time or energy to spend a lot of time other than what I was doing here. Because I did plant, well, with the help of a crew, all of these things. There were no grapes here. Mm -hmm. yeah, but most of them were just clearing the land, and uh, which was uh, pretty far gone. It had all, almost all been farmed except for a few acres, but it had been way over here. It was like second or third growth fir trees. It took a lot of trees off of here just to get back at the land. 
And uh, so now it's been pretty busy. I'm Rachel Woody. I'm here with Joe Alexa. This is the continuation of our interview on August 17th. We're here at Ankeny Vineyard and Winery. And Joe, you said a couple things I want to follow up on. The first is you made the comment that you have been a spectator when you were involved in some of the wine industry organizations. And so as a spectator, I'm curious to know how you've seen both the local and the state organizations evolve. Well, they have evolved tremendously from uh, a very few people and uh, so, some very competent people involved that I think carried it a long way in a short period of time. I've been impressed with the people who are, were willing to spend their time and energy on that sort of thing. And I'm not, uh, I say I did enough of that at work that I wasn't much inclined to uh, get involved uh, on the side mm -hmm. on my own time, but I really appreciate the efforts of those who did. And I say they've, we've come a long way in 50 years, mostly through the energies of uh, half a dozen or so uh, key players that uh, really um, kept it going and to where it is now. And who were some of those key players that you remember? Well, they were so the other winery names, the Ponzi's, the uh, Adelsheim's, and the, um, who else I can think of? David Lett was, of course, the great star. And uh, I don't think he was involved all that much in the, the uh, early organization. Uh, he could well have been, but I didn't know. A lot of this went on in uh, the McMinnville area, because that's where most people were, mm -hmm. of the wineries. and. Uh, us folks on the outskirts uh, had to drive a long way to get there to take part in that. And uh, so I was disinclined and I'm not sure too many other people. Uh, Don Byard was really involved too, I think, from this and the, and the folks from Bethel Heights, mm -hmm. um, the Castiles uh, were, were players in, in those days. And what were some of those early issues, especially from the perspective of you as a wine grower? What were some of the issues that had to be overcome at that time, and, and what are issues that still need to be overcome? I think probably the biggest, scariest one was the phylloxera thing mm -hmm. that came through, and uh, a lot of people uh, put a lot of energy into dealing with that one, having to replant and whatnot. All my grapes are on their own roots, which is kind of unique now. I think probably less than half of the Oregon vineyards are own roots, which there are some people feel that that makes for better wine. but. Mm -hmm. the, it's a debatable question. Uh, that's probably the worst. I think we've had uh, some pretty good results uh, working with the state as far as regulation goes. That's always been an issue. And by and large, the wine bill that went through originally uh, was a pretty broad-based uh, form of organization that I think has, to my knowledge, has not been any real problems uh, in, in terms of uh, impeding any of the organization, that expansion that went on. There was a lot of information that uh, came out of uh, California for the most part. I think uh, OSU probably uh, played a major role in uh, locally, and now Chemeca is doing something in terms of hands-on uh, application of vineyard and winemaking skills have carried through. So there's been some pretty good organized support for the industry that I think has helped to uh, facilitate its development. Mm -hmm. that uh, it would have been harder and longer otherwise. Mm -hmm. From your perspective, especially working for the state, have you seen Oregon in general, both legislatively and maybe culturally, sort of change its knowledge or attitude about the wine industry here? Oh, most definitely, most definitely. When I started <laughs> my tasting room back in the, uh, in the 80s, uh, I can remember uh, this one woman coming in and said, don't give me none of that sour wine. And uh, people were really into drinking uh, sweeter wines and it, it took a, a ways for folks to, I think, adjust to dry wines and certainly Pinot Noirs. Mm -hmm. So that's been an evolution, but now 30 years later, it's amazing how, how people, uh, how Oregonians have turned to wine. Mm -hmm. And now it's become uh, pretty much of a common thing. It's, no longer a standout. I don't hear myself being called a wino anymore. So <laughs> <laughs> early on, and uh, yeah, I think it's uh, the industry has sort of matured, mm -hmm. as well as the, the population by and large in terms of their acceptance of wine. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, and now with you throw in food and music and uh, things that were be better than ever here. 
Mm -hmm. So that's when I stopped distributing and I decided it was better to make efforts to get people to come here rather than me go there mm -hmm. and, uh, and fight it out on the distribution market. As I'm sure you've all gone into stores and seen literally a thousand or more labels on, on wines out there. Mm -hmm. And that's just a very, very competitive market to be in. So less is better as far as I'm concerned. And I, I say I, I still sell most of my grapes, almost all of them now. I'm just making probably a thousand or so cases uh, that's to be sold here. Mm -hmm. And even, even less than that since uh, kind of on a downhill side here, um, health-wise, medical-wise, after 35 years here. So slowing down, time to retire. Or at least think about it, right. and that's part of it. <laughs> I I don't know if this is too personal, Joseph. Feel free to tell me to butt out. But do you have a succession plan for, like, an understudy working here, or maybe selling the property? No, it'll get sold. Mm -hmm. It'll get sold, and someone will come in, and I don't know if they'll continue it as a vineyard uh, or if they'll turn it into a mobile home park or something. Who knows? <laughs> I don't think you have to be afraid of that. I, I think. You have a beautiful vineyard here. I'm sure someone will want it's, to come to uh, it. Uh, I think it's established itself as a good place to grow grapes and one of the earliest ripening sites in the valley. So that should keep it going. So no, I have that beyond that, no. All right. So I don't have a successor standing in the wings waiting to take over anything like that. To get back to your change in strategy with the food, music, and wine, instead of fighting with distributors to get your wine on the shelf, how have you seen that strategy evolve? Was that a hard change or fairly easy for you? It's, um, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. I've just done what I've done mm -hmm. and it's never had problems, but I think it depends on where you are and what you're trying to do. Right. Uh, in terms of the uh, dealing with the, uh, the county, the county seems to carry a lot of weight with regulating uh, wineries, and I think it's probably much different uh, uh, other counties besides Marion County. We've never had a lot of problems here, mm -hmm. or with the state. The feds, we never hear from them, except for the label issues. That's always been that's probably the biggest issue as far as I can see now. Mm -hmm. Getting uh, all the labels have to be approved by what is now TTB, and uh, they're uh, not exactly outstanding performers and being able to work with them and rapid return. Right. So there's still ongoing issues uh, with regulation. Mm -hmm. And then the shipment is a bizarre from we've gone from being able to ship anywhere to now you can't ship anywhere practically without having to buy licensing. Mm -hmm. And that's been very restrictive. And that's another reason why I decided to really stay small mm -hmm. and to uh, nowadays to export out of Oregon, where most of the wine goes, is, uh, or much of it, I'm not sure what the balance is, uh, takes a lot more organization and expense to get permits from all the various states and uh, file all their reports. And mm -hmm. Some states uh, you need to report every two weeks to maybe two or three different uh, tax regulators or the sales tax or the alcohol regulators. So it's a full-time job for somebody for bigger wineries, maybe s several somebodies. Mm -hmm. And that's just, uh, that's one of the major differences I've seen. Our ability to sell out of state has been uh, much more restrictive. Mm -hmm. Well, you must have quite a good support group fairly locally, especially to have events and sell your wine mostly locally. Would you say that's the case? Most of the customers are local, Corvallis, Albany, Salem, and uh, although Saturday we had a, a stretch limo with 18 people came down from Portland. So word is getting out that uh, the food and mm -hmm. mostly the pizzas, wood-fired pizza is a real draw. <laughs> uh -huh. And uh, I've been fortunate to have some uh, a really excellent uh, young cook that uh, is a recent graduate from Culinary Institute of uh, America at Hyde Park, New York, which is considered the Harvard of uh, cooking schools, came out here and wanted to learn how to grow grapes and make wine and wow. taught him how to make pizza and we, he took <laughs> off and running. So he'll be here at noon, Wonderful. Matthew, Matthew Caledona. So yeah, it's, uh, it all sort of came together, but people thought I was crazy when I built that oven five years ago. So, and now you're reaping the rewards. Definitely, and good pizzas too. And good pizzas. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, if you're going to have wine, you need to, I think, well, 
food. I mean, they're highly recommended. You, wine is a food product, and mm -hmm. it's not uh, like beer you sit around and drink all day and watch television. Um, but you really need to have it with food to really appreciate it. And we've tried to match wine with uh, food, pizza, and some other things. And uh, you throw in the music, uh, and that's a good incentive for people to sit down, relax, and uh, have a meal. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is, uh, I think, one of the fastest changes I've been seeing in the last several years since we got off the ground here is most of the tasting rooms you went into in the old days had no place to sit down. They didn't encourage you to stay, buy wine and leave. So mm -hmm. now it's a more uh, friendly, uh, accepting attitude, I think, in many places. And they realize that people, it's a uh, convivial thing to sit down with friends and Test, uh, taste wine or share food and yeah I think that's really the uh, the wave of the future here and I think that's what's really going to help Oregon a lot in terms of people coming here. Mm -hmm. In the last five or six years I've found more and more tourists coming who came come to Oregon specifically to, to wine tour right. and the word is out so uh, that that's helped a lot. Right where do you think the future of Oregon wine is headed? Well, that's what I just described. Unfortunately, we're not big enough to soak up all the wine because there's room for expansion. There's thousands of acres of really uh, primo grape land, and which is being soaked up already by uh, the French. There are several French companies here now who came here specifically to grow Pinot Noir as several California companies. Uh, Kendall Jackson, the, the ninth largest wine company in the country has bought like 1,500 acres across the river here in Polk County mm -hmm. to grow Pinot Noir. And uh, I think as the drought uh, impacts uh, California more, you're going to see more of that, the, the big money wineries coming in. And uh, we haven't had very many of those. For years I sold to King Estate, which is, has got to be the world's leader in terms of spending money on, on a winery and a vineyard. And the last figure I heard was $40 million. You know, 10 or 15 years ago, but uh, wow. beautiful place, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Have you interviewed down there? With I anyone? definitely have driven by and seen it from the freeway. Now it's worth the trip. Yeah. It's a gorgeous place. They now have a great restaurant and a tasting room, but uh, they were one of the biggest ones. And then there's Jim at Willamette Valley and uh, some others, Domain Serene, the, the, the monumental wineries, I call them, the, the grand mm -hmm. places. So mm -hmm. that's happening more. So little places like this are going to become uh, not extinct, but probably less rare in terms of the market. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it'll always be there, and I think that's where the real reputation ultimately is going to be, is, is the unique small wineries that are good locations, good wines, and uh, people who are traveling to buy them. But it's really hard for a small winery to export out of state. I mean, it's a difficult process. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've known a number of people who started out and made good wine and grew. And everyone said, well, you should get bigger. And they got bigger. And then they had to go out of state. And uh, then they usually went broke shortly thereafter. And uh, so it, it's uh, not easy. But I think ultimately the future is good and uh, as, as more people get into it and there's more organizational, there are better maps now and the various, I'm in two or three winery organizations that put out brochures and maps and uh, mm -hmm. that's helped a lot. Mm -hmm. So bicyclists, we had, bicy we had Cycle Oregon came through here a couple of weeks ago and there were a thousand people. I mean it was mobbed, I've never seen so many <laughs> oh people goodness. here. but. Then they were mostly from other places that mm. came to join in on Cycle Oregon. So I think the word is out that Oregon is unique when it comes to some wines, particularly Pinot Noir. Mm. Even the French have now admitted that Oregon, Willamette Valley, is the place for this grape. Mm -hmm. uh, cloudy skies, cool nights, warm days, does the job. And the Van Duzer Quarter, which we have to due west, which is the lowest point in the coast range. Mm -hmm. And you can see that and along with the highest point in the coast range is Mary's Peak, just to the south of it. So instead of answer to a trivia question, if you're playing geographic trivia, <laughs> there's your answer. Uh -huh. But that makes a difference because we do get a cooling breeze in the afternoons here, even on the hottest days. Mm. It seems to cool down. And uh, if you go up to the cemetery, you can see that view very clearly. Mm -hmm. 
which is another little attraction here is the you can drive up to the Pioneer Cemetery and uh, take in the view on a clear day like this it's gorgeous mm -hmm. do you think we'll see more wineries and vineyards in this area specifically because of the Van Duzer corridor and the cooling winds well, we already are in uh, in Polk County, particularly is where most of the new wineries seem to be going in. Mm -hmm. And uh, Perry's, what is it? Perrydale. 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 Keep. I just know someone who bought a 250-acre lot over there, and I think that's per, pretty much where Kendall Jackson has been focusing on. So, mm -hmm. a lot of growth. Although I think mainly because Yamhill County has become very expensive for new wineries and vineyards, so they're coming south and mm -hmm. finding good places mm -hmm. further south and so I think that will continue and even right on this side there's hundreds of acres here available that um, right now are just in brush and blackberries so right. grapes seem to be a, a natural thing if someone has the energy and the money to do it mm -hmm. so there's lots of uh, yeah, lots of room for expansion but again it's a question of marketing that uh, you grow the grapes and make the wine but then you have to sell it so that's the toughest part of it mm -hmm. and uh, tell people you, you have to you can it's fun growing grapes less fun making wine but if you can't sell it you can't drink it all either so right uh, and uh, that's uh, that's one that needs balance because it, it, they say it's easy to get in over your head and I've, I've seen people do that mm -hmm. who bought bigger equipment bigger tanks and uh, then really were pushed to have to go out and travel around the country selling it. And mm -hmm. That's never appealed to me. I say, I didn't get into this business to uh, fly on airplanes, go around, talk to distributors all around the planet. That's never appealed to me. So mm -hmm. then you can do that. When you started out here, you were pretty much the first in the area. Is that correct? No. Nah. Who else was around here? Uh, yeah, right here locally. Uh, and Myron Redford was in Amity, maybe the closest one. Um, I'm Which trying is to pretty think. Far of, away. <laughs> yeah, it is. No, this South uh, Salem Hills uh, has been. Uh, yeah, I guess I was the first here. Yes. Yeah, so, what was that like? I mean, we always hear the stories of, oh, you know, people shared equipment and they just went to their neighbor. You didn't have a close neighbor, and you're no, in a no, no. That made that, that, that made a difference. On the other hand, I didn't share equipment with somebody who had phylloxera in oh. their vineyard and, <laughs> and bring it over. Right. So uh, yeah, that was that was good and bad. We we shared ideas basically, and back then uh, there wasn't as uh, the equipment issue was. I mean, the tractors that were available weren't really suited for vineyards. They were huge, humongous mm -hmm. field tractors and. Uh, it was only later than you got reasonable sized equipment to uh, deal with. But mostly it was, I think, an exchange of information as much or more than an exchange of equipment. Mm -hmm. People borrowed trucks. I borrowed trucks from people. And that's always an issue about harvest. Do you have a truck? Can you haul it? <laughs> you have anybody to pick it? That sort of mm -hmm. questions that are much more than uh, are the grapes ripe? Mm -hmm. So it's all part of the, what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and it's the same every year, but every year it's different, which makes it interesting. Would you say you have a, a winemaking or a grape growing philosophy? Not really. Uh, I like to put them in the ground and let them grow. And uh, I like to, like to think the wine makes itself. I just help it out a little bit. And mm -hmm. I try to do minimal amount of processing. Mm -hmm. And uh, now that I've gotten smaller, I'm even you know, trying to do uh, some Pinot Noir that's uh, not only unfiltered and unfined, but unpressed. Mm -hmm. And not using a press and having all free run wine. Oh, interesting. And experimenting in uh, fermenters in, in the barrels itself. Take the tops, we've just taken the tops off a half a dozen or so wooden barrels, wine barrels, and we'll be in, in the barrel. So, a lot more work intensive because you're only dealing with 60 gallons of must at a time but um, it makes a difference in terms of the pH and acid I think so we'll see because mm -hmm. my idea of a good wine is a wine that's very smooth in the mouth I don't like that when it makes your <laughs> so acidy so tannic that uh, puckers you up mm -hmm. you know it should be smooth it should flow like velvet is my idea of what wine is and uh, there's there's things you can do to um, ensure that, if not avoid it, uh, but certainly uh, 
a lot of the wines were made. It was a, kind of a sharp learning curve for a lot of people. And, uh, but I haven't uh, had a bad Pinot Noir from Oregon in years. So I think uh, we've come a long way in that sense. Mm -hmm. But mostly it's in the grapes. Most uh, wineries I th or winemakers, I think, will say that 85% of the wine quality is the grapes. You got good grapes, you can generally get good wine. If you, mm -hmm. Bad grapes, really tough <laughs> to make good wine. And uh, ripe grapes is the bottom line. Mm -hmm. So that's um, a challenge sometimes. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, everybody's different, and I say wine is a totally subjective uh, thing. So if you like the wine, it's a good wine, whether it's uh, not won gold medals or it has won gold medals and you don't like it, it's not a good wine. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, there's uh, some philosophical differences there on how wines are made. Because in order to make a wine age a long time, it has to be pretty tannic young. and. Uh, one thing I've learned is that most of the wines improve with age and several years on a Pinot makes a big difference frequently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but it's all different and I think we're still, I think we've figured out how to uh, grow the grapes now to get them ripe, but there's still uh, a wide variation on f wine making philosophies. There's nothing, not a, not a settled uh, idea on how to do it. So, which is good. Everybody tries to do it in their own way. Mm -hmm. And we'll find out, but that's going to take uh, a while, probably a couple generations, to uh, to really get. Uh, there aren't that many vineyards. Uh, my oldest grapes are over 30 years old, and there aren't that many of those around. And uh, age makes a difference. Uh, and people tell me that Pinot Noir doesn't come on its own until the plants are at least 10 years old. So then you get the soil differences. The Climatic differences where you are located on the hillside, north, south facing or whatever. Mm -hmm. A lot of variation that they were still in the process of finding out. And most of us by experiment. You either try it and see what works. Or if it doesn't work, you go somewhere else or you're out of business. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, say I lucked out when I picked this location and I've never had a bad crop. So that's uh, a good sign. Mm -hmm. I would say so. Do you have a favorite wine to make or drink? Pinot Noir. What else of is course. there? Of <laughs> yeah, course. I, I, I have I, to ask the question. <laughs> I, I hesitate to muddy my taste buds with drinking other than Pinot Noir. So, mm -hmm. No, I, I drink um, uh, everything, mm -hmm. most everything. Cabs, we're bringing in some cabs now that we're trying to expand the offering and I'll bring in some uh, East East uh, Washington Cabernet Cabernet Franc, mm -hmm. but it's a different uh, you know it's uh, I think it's they're two different really different wines and it depends on what you like and I think Pinot Noir to me is much more complex and subtle than most uh, Bordeaux grapes mm -hmm. and uh, what I'm finding over time here is that uh, most of the young people like bigger, bolder flavors, those in-your-face flavors. I have Marichal Foch, for example, which mm -hmm. is closer to a Bordeaux grape, and that's been a very popular grape. Mm -hmm. But uh, Pinot Noir lovers, uh, yeah, I think they're really appreciative of more complexity and subtlety than, uh, it's more of a sipping wine than mm -hmm. in-your-face wine. So anyway, it's all a matter of taste. Mm -hmm. For your consumers, the people who come to Ankeny to enjoy your wine, how do you think they would identify your wine? What would be some of the characteristics of it? Smoothness, complexity, flavor. I mean, that, that's the comments I get most time is, is all the wines are smooth. They, they feel good in the mouth. And that's what I'm trying to achieve, even with the non-Pinots, the Chardonnay and the Fauche. And, and the rest of them, and the blends, we're putting blends together now. And uh, they just got to have that balance between the acid and the sugars that, that really make for a, a pleasant experience when, you, when you're tasting it. And as I say, I, any time a wine makes you grimace, it's not a good wine. <laughs> and whether they, you know, a hundred dollar bottle of wine or not, uh, no. Unfortunately, a lot of the more expensive wines tend to be made in a more ta tannic style because that's what ages better over time. Mm -hmm. And while you need to wait four or five years 
uh, until the wine is fully, fully developed, I think. And people ask me when to drink Pinots. I tell them three to five years after the vintage date, which you have to point out is the date on the label. As people are confused, thinking that uh, the vintage date is when the wine went in the bottle, which is not true. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, uh, it's when the grapes were picked. And, uh, and Oregon has vintages where California, it doesn't matter. They're always ripe. They're always overripe frequently. Mm. So, uh, but Oregon, that's critical, is the vintage date. And we do have some years that are better than others. Oh, just the nature of the game. Right. Are there any years that you recall that were like, oh gosh, you know, 83, that was a great year? Oh, there were several. It's been uh, through the early, late 90s, it was almost every other year mm -hmm. was a really good vintage. And same way in, in the 2000s, we've had maybe one bad year out of three or four, here anyway. Mm -hmm. That, uh, again, early ripening is the key. And we've had several bad years in the last five where the rains came on heavy in September. And I was fortunate enough to have ripe grapes before the real rains hit. Right. Yeah, I think it was probably 2011, where before har if you if you harvested before the rains hit versus after the rains hit, there's some differences there mm -hmm. in the wines. As rains, uh, it's okay to have rain, but uh, you need a couple of days of sunshine to dry them out. And if you don't get that couple of days of sunshine, it really it pulls down the sugars, dilutes the acids, and it's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. So unless you get that reprieve. Uh, following up and frequently that happens and that it's usually later up into October and at that point you're dealing with um, mildew and botrytis and birds and right. a whole nine yards so earlier is better that's what I think if harvesting on September 15 is uh, evidence of uh, climate change I'm all for it <laughs> <So>. <laughs> that was one of my follow-up questions is how you think you the climate change has affected or will affect well, my stock answer to that one is, uh, I tell people, I'm holding off on planting pineapples. Ah, a little early yet to one. tell. <laughs> so it's, uh, but if anything, it's going to benefit Oregon. Uh, earlier harvests are better. Mm -hmm. If you can get the grapes ripe in September, particularly uh, when there's still lots of blackberries around, because starlings love blackberries, first of all. When the blackberries are gone, the grapes are next. I see. And the later into October you go, the more problems with starlings and birds in general, mm -hmm. but starlings are the big ones. Mm -hmm. I think it was 11 when I went through myself, 60 boxes of shotgun shells, along wow. with friends who bought their own <laughs> shotguns out and just blazed away. They were hungry birds coming, and right. uh, birds can devastate a vineyard in a matter of hours. Absolutely, yeah. So yeah, earlier is better, and this year, been no problems, drier, uh, that means less mildew, mm -hmm. less botrytis, so it's easier when the weather is, is better. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't always happen, and I'm not sure it's going to always will happen, even with climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll see. But it's been enough of a cycle that I've seen, just in the short time I've been here, that I'm not ready to commit to basic change yet. Okay. So, we'll see. You mentioned starlings. Are there any other pests out here in your area that you have to be concerned about? Uh, I don't have deer problems, which a lot of people have deer for some. I'm, well, I'm trellised differently. I, I have my fruiting wire is higher than most people. Mm. Most people have their fruiting wire low to the ground. They have what well, the difference in trellising systems, the vertical curtain, which is what most people have, where they have to train and tie up the uh, the grapes to go up, and the the fruit is closer to the ground. Now, it's because you do get more heat as you're closer to the ground, but uh, mm -hmm. it's a lot more involved in terms of mechanics. The, uh, the trellising and wiring and whatnot, so I went with the cheapest possible way when I was starting out here, which was a single wire with fence posts holding it up. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and deer are basically pretty lazy. They'll walk through the vineyard and eat what's in front of their nose. They're not going to reach up. In most cases, I've never really had any problems. I've got all kinds of deer around here, mm -hmm. but I've never really had uh, problems with deer. And for that, I'm thankful. And I'm also thankful the starlings are the worst problem compared mm -hmm. to places, vineyards in Grants Pass, where they have black bears in the vineyard. Oh, gosh. And trying to shoo off a starling is a little different <laughs> from shooing off a black bear. So mm -hmm. there are benefits of location. Mm -hmm. 
What would you say is your most memorable experience in the industry? Or a fun story or anecdote that you love to tell everybody about your time in the industry? I think you've heard it all already, but, yeah? but pretty right. much, <laughs> pretty much. No, at this stage of the game, most of it just a blur. It's been too long, too many things happened. And uh, the last five years I've been dealing with uh, health issues, so I've really not been paying that much attention to what's coming down. But uh, mm -hmm. the biggest thing was just getting this tasting room and the winery off the ground. And mm -hmm. They say the, the food and the ambiance has really made a huge difference in the last five years. So that's probably the biggest change that I've experienced here. And finally getting it all done and planted. Where are these people coming from? <laughs> yeah, you're not quite open yet, are you? No, and Matthew's not even here. Oh well, they can wait. <laughs> well, I only have one last question for you, and that's the, is there anything I've forgotten or anything you want to share with us? No, off the top of my head, no. I can't think of anything. All right. It's, um, I just appreciate your being here and the project that you're doing. I think that's much needed and uh, a good thing. Otherwise, it all slides away. and. Mm. over time and no one will remember what happened but it has been in 50 years a major change in Oregon they say for in Oregon agriculture anyway I can't tell you how many grass seed farmers were laughing as I was planting grapes but all of a sudden grapes are, are where it's at and right. uh, so that that's been a big change and also people's appreciation for wine I think that's that's a major big change It just in a relatively short period of time has happened and I'm very grateful for that. Right. Well, thank you so much, Jeff, for your time.